Okay, hello everyone. Um, as it's just reaching 11.30, let's start things off. So welcome very much to this event, Outnumbered, Statistics, Data and the Public Interest. And welcome to CRASH. My name's Daniel Wilson. I'm a researcher here on the Technology and Democracy Project, run by Professors John Norton and David Runciman. Um, our project's been an attempt to investigate the impact of new technologies on democratic life, um, both now and in the past. Um, all the topics we've explored in the two years of this project, privacy and surveillance, platform capitalism, automation of jobs, new forms of power in the networked world, the question of quantification and the numerical basis of all these developments has been a clearly visible phenomenon in the background. And so today's an attempt to think about some of these foundational issues underlying a digital society. As data is collected by an increasing number of entities, both private and public, We'd like to ask how the different processes of counting and enumerating people has produced specific political and economic forms. Now, collecting information about the public has often caused controversy from the failed attempts in Britain in the 1750s to start the census onwards. But it's usually been understood as a quid pro quo. But today, as information is increasingly collected in passive or even surreptitious ways, the nature of the exchange has become obscure. Who gets what? Who has the right to collect information about whom? And who should have the right to access it? Are questions that have left lawyers and policymakers scrambling to keep up. Now it's quite difficult to approach this topic without thinking immediately of big data. And something of that dizzying quality is clearly reflected in our title, Outnumbered. But we don't want today to be only about big data, because that term has taken on some elements of cliche, which perhaps hides some important aspects of what it is, and also how we got here. We'd like to focus on the shifting boundary of the public and private spheres. And to do that, to draw out some important aspects of this new numerical infrastructure being crafted around us and also out of us. In particular, we'd like to consider the ways in which claims about the public interest have been used to justify the collection of numbers, both today and in the past. Now, the collection of numbers, the more generic term I'm using to include both data and statistics, which are not the same thing, has a history dating back at least to the 3rd century BC, but it was John Grant who produced the first social statistics in Britain in the 1660s with his bills of mortality, which were perhaps, in fact, produced by William Petty. But these were a set of tables which allowed an investigation into the rates at which people died in a given area. And these would form the basis for Britain's highly influential life assurance industry. Britain eventually decided to organise a census in 1801, inspired in part by John Rickman, who argued for the importance of a national headcount. Listing the many reasons in favour, he claimed it was essential to know the size of the population for military planning, for food production, for sensible legislation, and also at a time of potential revolution to persuade people of the government's intention, as he put it, to promote the public good. Now, Rickman also listed an explicit benefit of the census as the stimulus it would provide for the life assurance industry. A reminder to us that, as the historian of science, Lorraine Daston, has shown, statistical and mathematical projects in previous centuries have been driven by the needs of mundane practices such as law and insurance, rather than by scientific discovery in a pure sense. However, on the other hand, more recent history suggests that the mere existence of the capacity to collect data has acted as its own technological imperative to do so, with the question of what to do with it all being worked out later. So censuses have long been controversial, and I'm not just thinking about the Jedi Knights controversy of 2001, when that became the fourth biggest religion in Britain, as I am of the 1991 census, for example, where up to a million people refused to complete their returns, thereby committing a criminal offence, um, because it was widely believed that the Tory government at that time would use its results to enforce the hated poll tax. And there are debates currently going on in the UK and the US about the proper form, or even whether we need at all to have any more, a census as currently scheduled in 2020 or 2021. And one further thing I'd like to point out here is that the role of health and medicine in driving this debate is not accidental. Interventions on human bodies, as well as investigations into their quantities, their births and deaths, have always been political. And I've already alluded to the importance of insurance in this story, but this relation continues today, not only in the US context, where health data and insurance um, have sparked controversy, but also here in the UK as well. 
Now, our colleague on this project, Julia Powles, who's sadly in New York now, has done vital work uncovering the way in which vast troves of patient data have been handed over with little or no scrutiny to Google's DeepMind division, an AI company which hopes to assist doctors in various ways which are as yet themselves hard to quantify. Now, as a company in the information business, Google have a voracious appetite for data sets, and so in one sense they're merely echoing the desire of the Victorian public medicine movement to acquire as many numbers as possible about the populations they're interested in studying. But on the other hand, there seems to be something very different going on in these two cases. Now, there's clearly a chance that big data will do amazing things in health and elsewhere. But the example of Google and the NHS shows there's been little or no debate, certainly at the political level, about the way in which the potential benefits of these innovations will be distributed between those owning the hardware and those supplying the data, in other words, us. And so it's in such a context that the notion of the public interest may perhaps play a useful role. So what do we mean by public interest? Now, alongside the widely understood meaning, which might be something like the common wheel or the well-being of the general population, you find more technical definitions in political science textbooks. But of course, it's hardly an unproblematic concept in itself. The public interest was used as the title of the founding journal of neoconservatism, launched in 1965 by Irving Kristol, and was deliberately chosen as a mischievous inversion to mean simply traditional common sense beyond ideology. And so some critics might worry that the public interest is a mystifying concept that can be used to mask vested interests. Nonetheless, the public interest retains a working meaning across different sectors, from the press, where it acts as a yardstick for deciding whether or not difficult stories get published, to the law, for instance, in antitrust, such that cartels and monopolies might be seen to be working against it. And so, notwithstanding some inevitable vagueness, the concept of the public interest invites a certain perspective on the work often hidden work that numbers in the form of data or stats do in our society. And it's with that in mind that we've assembled this particularly well-qualified set of speakers here today. Now, we asked you all to have a look at a piece by Ted Porter in advance. Don't worry, there won't be a quiz. I can see some people nerv nervously <laughs> <laughs> looking at a copy. Um, it was just really to focus everyone's minds on the topic and also in the hope that his discussion of the public sphere um, might be of use at some point in the course of today. Um, so let's go now to our first panel, which is on history and political economy. Um, our speakers will offer some thoughts and reflections, and there'll be lots of time for questions and discussion. Um, please also bear in mind that our second panel after lunch will be more explicitly digital in its focus. Um, now, since conceiving this event, we found ourselves unexpectedly in an election campaign dominated by number, where politicians get in trouble for forgetting the cost of their policies on live radio, and opinion pollsters offer daily hostages to fortune with their predictions. And so I'm particularly glad to introduce Professor Glenn O'Hara, a distinguished historian of modern Britain, Oxford Brooks, as well as a prolific commentator on electoral numbers. So thanks so much to Glenn for being here at this busy time. Um, after Glenn talks, we'll hear from Will Davies, reader in political economy at Goldsmiths, who's published on topics including neoliberalism, happiness, and Brexit, in that order, I think. Um, um, as well as on the question of what happens in a post-statistical world. So thanks to everyone for coming, and now I'll hand you over to Glenn O'Hara. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me also. I mean, I, I hesitate to say a uh, distinguished commentator on electoral numbers right at this exact moment, which is a kind of invite to a kind of, the kind of nightmare that my, my life has become. But um, we'll, we'll try to... Uh, ignore the general election to some extent. I'll use one slide to talk about how polls might help us with the idea of statistics as different from numbers. I'll talk very briefly. I'm going to talk for 10, 15 minutes because the point is for us to talk together as a workshop and not for me uh, and other talkers to, um, to activate ourselves, just to activate uh, everyone in the room. Um, and you can, if you want to talk about uh, electoral polling and read about electoral polling, you can always follow me on Twitter where myself and other fellows who are into polling try and puzzle out what on earth is going on. Um, I think the way I talk about numbers and statistics as a historian is that, especially outside of historians of statistics, we have, as historians, a very deeply coded set of presumptions about how the policy process works. And they are quite conservative with a small c. 
possibly because we ourselves work in universities and think tanks and, and, and such institutions, we think about ideas emanating in a rather idealist, and perhaps idealistic manner, and then they go on to become concrete policy proposals. They are then enacted in some imperfect manner. They produce numbers, and then the feedback loop starts again when those numbers are analyzed. So I think we see deeply uh, embedded in our mindset quite a mechanical and idealistic way for policy to be made, which is ideas, policies, processes, numbers, and then some more ideas in a feedback loop. Now, that is one of the most fruitful ways of seeing policy. That's why we do it, and that's a very, very important uh, way of analysing the policy process. But I think I was, I was rereading uh, the Oxford story in Jessie Harris's biography of, of William Beveridge the other day, and I think what she did in the conclusion of that, all the way back in the late 1970s, was shift the circular way policy is made in our minds to actually numbers begin with policy. So, in fact, the lodestone of the way in which numbers and statistics are made actually goes policy, mechanics, ideas, back to policy. Through all sorts of mechanisms, chance, bureaucracy, administration, the influence, for instance, of transnational idea movements and transnational examples, policies are enacted and then they produce the statistics that produce the ideas, which is, I think, a fruitful way of knocking our frame slightly so that we think anew about how history works. There's also, I think, and I'll talk about this in a minute, there's, I think, a, a statistical, <coughs> statistically driven and technologically driven determinism about statistical history, which says that statistics have become more important in the 20th century mm -hmm. because of the rise of computational technology and the fact that you know, SPSS and Excel on your laptop is far more powerful than the entire government in 1960 by, by many multiples. So therefore, there's more statistics because anybody can become uh, a statistical expert. Well, of course, that's absolutely right. But of course, I also want to uh, challenge that because I think technological innovation happened in the 19th century, early 20th century, and stimulated statistical ways of thinking. And I want, I think, I, I would want to shift discussion from what Ted Porter talks about brilliantly in that essay that we just heard about, which is the epistemological side or technical side of what he sees as the closing of the public sphere as statistics get harder to understand and there's sampling and there's modelling and it becomes mathematical, it's difficult for the layman to understand. And I would shift that to the demand side, why statistics change. And statistics change because increasingly there's a public appetite for what you might call imaged or pictured ways of understanding numbers. Just got one from ben, an article by Dennis Lynham in the Transactions of the Institute of British Geography in 2003, and that's the, the regional unemployment problem, quote unquote, in the 1930s, which of course was driving public comment, was driving government concern, was driving, in fact, uh, Whitehall concern about governability itself. What do you do when some areas of the North East have 60, 70% unemployment? How is that governable? Well, one way of understanding that is how can we improve uh, amounts of frictionless labour movement and uh, um, industrial migration. These are industrial workers, not total workers, from areas of high unemployment, big blocks of workers coloured in a deep black, heavy typeset, to areas that look are made to look empty. Of course, London and the South East are much more heavily populated than Wales, much more heavily populated than Wales overall, but here they're made to look empty in a way to help the, 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 BBC, the, the BBC listener, the BBC radio listener who wants to read the text of the broadcast in the listener, kind of understand what economists are getting at. So what I'm emphasizing there is the demand side, which is that there is a popular thirst in what you might call the BBC's educated listenership, which is absolutely huge in millions in the 1930s, to understand the unemployment problem. And it hasn't come from our normal policy frame of universities, Whitehall, proto-think tanks in the 1930s, like the Fabian Society. It's come from a deep market-driven thirst 
in the um, in the pop in the populace in the educated populace as, as they would have seen it then. Which brings us, I'm afraid, to the vexed question of opinion polls. And what I would talk about opinion polls since the 1980s is that opinion polls have become a form of popular consumption. They've become a, a, a quite a cheap way of producing headlines for your newspaper. They don't cost very much, uh, a, a crude voting intention poll, a crude headline poll. And you can put them on the front page if they're a shock, even if they are at one point in the bell curve of distribution and they're, they're, they're what you might call an outlier. By the way, outliers are the polls you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually your outline might be the truth. So that's just a little um, indicator there. What's going on at the moment, of course, is uh, a general election in which initially one's assumption would have been that Labour would have got a score in the high 20s, the Conservatives a score in the 40s somewhere, and there would have been an easy uh, downhill, a downhill uh, breaks off uh, cruise by the Conservatives to re-election. But instead, there's a remarkable surge upwards in the Labour overall vote. Uh, probably not enough to be a plurality, but still a, a large increase from a very low base into the mid-30s. But what I would emphasise is that that's, that's the BBC's daily tracker. That is a form of popular entertainment in many ways. That is a form of attracting uh, traffic to the BBC website. That is a form of understanding which is an incredibly crude way of understanding which is driven by programmers essentially uh, as in tv programs or radio programmers understandings of their segmented market which is people really really love polls and will consume them forever even though we've just had a general election two years ago where people said we'll never look at polls again um, but what that covers this is icm's penultimate poll of course, what that very entertainment-driven set of blue, red lines and other lines gives us is a really, really average and homogenised product which actually disguises a huge amount of intra an unprecedented amount of intra-party and inter-party churn, regional churn, and especially unprecedented amounts of generational churn where something like 65 to 70% of under 25 say they vote Labour, and something like 65 to 70% of over 65 say they'll vote Conservative. So those lines are a form that, yes, is technologically determined because of website technology, because of Java, because it's easy to put up. They're also a form of populist presentation, just like that form of the front page of The Listener was in the 1930s. Because I think there are a series of heroic stories about statistics which are about individuals, like John, Slut, John Snow and his cholera map, or you know, William Farr at the GRO uh, in the mid-19th century. Or there is a technological story which focuses in the 20th century on the code-breaking breakthroughs of the Second World War and the rise of the transistor and, and then the uh, computational power of the semiconductor and the microchip. And, of course, those are very powerful driving forces. However, other driving forces that surround them and in which they are nested must also be taken account of and we must be cognizant of them. Because the creation of Colossus in the Second World War is an interaction of a huge amount of stories. There's something else there, which is that those heroic stories don't take account of the slowness of innovation. They emphasise the rapidity of innovation. But in fact, from 42, 43, what we would recognise as a first modern computing power analysing U-boat statistics and code statistics to the breakthrough of the home interneted PC in the early 2000s, that's 60 to 70 years, which is a long period of time, actually not that much longer than the breakthrough of the steam engine not, not much shorter than the mass breakthrough of the steam engine in the late 18th century, early 19th century. And it is a story that exists in the context of, for instance, gendered work. Who was it in the early British technological computer breakthrough who did lots of that work? Well, it was a new white-collared female workforce that then in, in Mary Hicksley's book, which I confess I haven't read yet, but I've, I've, I've read about it, she argues he's pushed the, that female um, 
workforce is pushed out of the computer industry, and that helps to explain why Britain's uh, computer breakthroughs of the 40s and 50s were not sustained, because the United States, the gender balance of the workforce that was there in the 40s and 50s was maintained, and therefore IBM is able to compete better because they've got twice as many people to, to work there. Um, any number, I just said here, you could bring in any number of stories. Britain's early electric national grid allows it a huge amount of power into computers. Capital markets are, it's easy to sell to banks for various reasons, computing technology in the 40s and 50s. Barclays and uh, such banks, they love this stuff. The attitude, as David Edgerton has said, uh, has put it in Warfare States, the attitude of British administrators to technological innovation is in fact very, very open, despite the caricature we have in our own minds of the classically educated Oxbridge graduates as a British uh, public administrator. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, in, fact, in their uh, attitude to technology, computing technology for statistics, which is they're very, very keen on it. Despite it does become more complex, it does become more pushed away from the public sphere. It also becomes part of the public sphere, these new statistics. Keynes's national income identity and Richard Stone's use of it during the war to create the first set of national accounts, in and out, is actually very, very simple, very journalistic. It's just the economy equals consumption, investment, government purchase. And of course, as we know from recent biographies, Keynes makes a huge amount of cash from his journalism and from his consultancy and from his private consultancy to bank shareholders, what we now think of as hedge funds, governments all around the world. And this is a shop window in many ways for such work. It's easy to grasp, it's easy to understand. It's not that hard when it's presented in this manner, just like our polls from the 1970s, 1980s onwards, Westminster opinion polls. To, to finish, I think, to bring government into this and governance into this, again, to emphasise the demand side, governments usually get what they want from the statistical community. And as Hugh Hecklow, the social scientist, put it in the 1970s, governments puzzle just as much as they power. Governments grope forward in a kind of fog, not really knowing all, always what they're going to find. And then they often find things that are very unfamiliar, strange, and uh, un unwelcome often. Harold Wilson's government wants to know about regional productivity. It wants to know about the effect of raising family allowances in rather the same mould that Gordon Brown wants to know about the effect of tax credits. Of course, the most redistributive effect, uh, policy in the last 100 years has been Brown's policy of tax credits, by far. And he wanted to know how that affected the labour market. He wanted to know about how that affected the gender balance of the labour market how it affected people's working when they had young children. Cameron and Osborne, in the kind of more liberal phase of this conservative phase of government that we're going through now, wanted to know about, for instance, gross national well-being rather than GDP, partly because they feared that GDP was going to stagnate. But they wanted to know about gross national well-being part, partly because they wanted to uh, pose or create a more... Um, caring image, a more socialised image for their conservatism. And those statistics were usually produced. And they are, most of those policy-driven statistical breakthroughs, very, very useful to historians and social scientists. So to conclude, numbers and then the statistics, the numbers of data of the state that are based on those numbers, I think are not just produced via innovative thought breakthroughs and innovative ideas. They are also produced by governments. I don't just mean governments in London and in Edinburgh, Belfast, Cardiff. I mean governments, uh, plural, across the policymaking field. And in this case, this is a University of UK uh, recent report on how much students, foreign students, bring into the economy and how they conceptualise that, they conceptualise that regionally. Now, you could have conceptualised that as city regions or cities, because, of course, this city, billions of pounds coming in from EU non-EU students. The southwest, if you look to the southwest, that would be clustered in Truro, Bristol, Bath. It wouldn't be clustered in Devon, Dorset. 
So they've conceptualised that regionally for policy reasons, I suspect, to have policy influence. As we go forward in, I think, what is proving to be an unprecedented period of policy flux in the British state, and a series really of, of punctuated policy detonations from the Scottish independence referendum right through to this snap election, I think that we are going to have to focus on a series of key indicators because there's going to be a huge amount of noise uh, because we're not sure where we're going and we're not even sure how we know where we're going. What would they be for me? The UK's labour productivity performance is absolutely pitiful. Why is that? And that's at the root of all of our politics for me economically. Why can't we break out of our basically zero sum productivity increases since the economic crisis of 2007-8. Next is how are we becoming so divided in terms of uh, our voting patterns? I'll hazard a guess that the election next week will see Labour's vote move forward massively in cities and ebb massively in towns. Why is that? Um, migration. As it probably falls away, what kind of migration is falling away? Where is it falling away to? How is that affecting the first two points about voting and productivity? And these are going to be demand-led statistics. Statistics driven by our policy needs, just as the demand-led statistics in the 20th century I've talked about today always were. But there, I'll leave it, I think. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me along here today. Um, I'm going to be talking um, partly about some issues that I raised in an article uh, for The Guardian uh, in January, which has the title, inevitably not my own title for these things, uh, which was How Statistics Lost Their Power and Why We Should Be Afraid of What Comes Next. So um, uh, that's what some of what I'm going to be talking about is, is uh, sort of based on extrapolating. But the... Um, the context for what I want to explore in very general terms is um, the role of numbers in the current crisis of representative democracy. Um, and unless you've been living on Mars for the last year, um, you will be familiar with the concepts in everyday public debate of populism, post-truth, crisis of expertise. Michael Gove's fav famous remark before the referendum last summer that I think people have had enough of experts which he was sort of pilloried for, but I think in some ways he was kind of proved right. Um, the books on post-truth are emerging from the journalists, all heroically stepping up to the plate to save truth from the coming um, uh, sort of attack on, on liberalism and, and, and so on. In Washington, D.C., there is a, a, a various people with a slightly uh, shaky grasp of the truth at the moment. Um, there was the famous phrase about alternative facts produced by Kellyanne Conway, um, and Sean Spicer's various um, strange remarks about um, disagreeing with the facts, and, and then, of course, there's Trump. So all of that's sort of going on, and it's being framed as a crisis of truth in rather sort of grand um, uh, sort of Platonist terms. I'm going to argue that um, what we're looking at is not really, I don't think the term post-truth is particularly helpful, but what we're looking at is not the death, but in some respects the... Uh, declining authority of a regime of numbers that Glenn has, um, has been talking about uh, that emerged in the English context in quite a narrow window of historical time, roughly between the English Civil War and the late 17th century, uh, which gave us uh, not only statistics, but also uh, systematic record keeping in uh, the central state by the Treasury and customs records uh, and so on, and the um, Glenn meant, oh, sorry, Daniel mentioned um, about uh, people like John Graunt and the, the, the uh, uh, bills of mortality and so on. Um, and I'm not suggesting that that is about to die. Um, what I'm suggesting is that it is uh, being at least supplemented, if not necessarily replaced, by the rise of a different regime of numbers that we can also date, uh, I, I think, to uh, a period shortly after the, the American Civil War. Um, I, I didn't quite know what to make with this, but I think there's an interesting issue about numbers in, in relation to civil war and peace, and that's what I think, anyway, just throw that out there. But the rise of uh, techniques of managerial uh, quantification, things like market research, um, uh, uh, professional management, the foundation of 
first American business school in Wharton in 1871 and so on, and basically the rise of the corporation. And I was at uh, uh, the uh, brilliant conference on corporate power and technology that this project uh, uh, organized back in the end of March, which was in some ways about this, 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 this phenomenon of, of, of the role of, of the corporation in producing the forms of knowledge that uh, the public is then dependent on. Um, so we're moving, what we're looking at is a shift between these different regimes um, of numbers. Um, and one way, I'm going to try and conclude by, by explaining what I mean by this, but in some ways what we're looking at at the moment is uh, an expansion of powers of quantification and a reduction of powers of measurement, which is an important conceptual distinction, which I'll, I'll, try, and, I'll try and clarify uh, what I mean by that. But first of all, what is, the, what is the crisis today? Now, clearly something's happened. <laughs> all of this post-truth stuff, and uh, we've had enough experts. Something has, 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 has happened. And there are some interesting, uh, aspects, the, so interesting aspects of how uh, uh, populism is not just perhaps not very uh, not rooted in statistics and evidence and, and, and facts, but in some respects is fueled and, and fuels a hostility to these things. That there is an actual, uh, it is antagonistic to the notion of, of, of statistics as a basis for uh, public decision making and authority. Um, and some examples of that. One, again, I'm sort of draw, drawing on um, some of the work that's been done here by, by John and others in the, uh, their, their project on conspiracy theories and, and polit in public life. Um, one of the most interesting uh, findings in the YouGov survey that the project uh, ran was that the majority of people in the, in the UK think the government is not just misrepresenting the number of immigrants living in this country, but they are lying about the number of immigrants living in the country. And this is the majority of people. And as you get older, it goes higher and higher and higher to the point where in, in people in their 60s and, and, and upwards, uh, are, are, you know, I can't remember the exact figures, but it's, it's quite striking that people actually think that this, these numbers are, are actually cooked. They're not just wrong, but they're cooked. Um, there was a very sharp division between Trump supporters and Clinton supporters um, over whether or not you, government, federal economic data is reliable or not. Um, and again, the sense that uh, amongst Trump, you wouldn't be surprised to know which way it's, but uh, the, the sense amongst Trump supporters that this data was not just sort of unreliable or perhaps not entirely accurate, but actually uh, was manipulated uh, in some way. So there is a kind of at least a crisis of credibility uh, of statistics in amongst uh, these populist movements. Now, there is, I suppose, one way of understanding populism, and I think the term is quite useful, but the way I would define populism is that it is uh, fundamentally anti-representational. And it's anti-representational in both a constitutional sense, in the sense that it tries to, it believes that politics and democracy can circumvent constitutional democracy and, 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 and notions of, of representation that it implies, but also in an epistemological sense. It is an attack on the right of certain minorities, and minorities not in the sort of identity terms, but sort of expert minorities, um, to define reality, whether that be climate or economy or society and so on. And I think that you know, one of the most interesting things about the Brexit referendum was the, the map, of, the, the, the map of, of, of Scotland and Northern Ireland were more predictable, but the map of England, the huge sea of blue, and then the, these, these big lumps of yellow, which were the remain bits, and it was basically a map of the knowledge economy and of universities. Uh, the knowledge economy of the Thames Valley and uh, the, you know, the big lump of yellow going the whole way out of London up to uh, Oxford and then down to uh, Bristol and then back down the, the um, M4 pretty much, of sort of places where Microsoft and these kind of places are based. And then the small towns that voted for Remain rather than Leave were uh, Leicester, uh, Norwich, Exeter, with apologies to any Geordies here, Newcastle. These were the towns which uh, are, are in some ways university uh, towns which if they, the, uh, towns of similar sizes didn't go the same way. Now that's not a kind of, I don't want to make a hard and fast theory about that, but I think it's an interesting issue about that knowledge was certainly in, in play uh, to a great extent and the, that in some respect populism is, a, is, a, is an attack on, 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 on the right to, to, to represent and to define uh, reality in certain respects. But there was also, I think, key uh, sociological drivers which are undermining um, the authority of statistics in public life, um, which need to be taken seriously before we make this all about, you know, these people like uh, Farage and Trump and so on, uh, who are sort of, or go for that matter, who are attacking the, the role of experts in, in public life. If you look at Thomas Piketty's um, uh, most recent paper, it shows that 50% of American workers have had no increase in their uh, uh, income since 1978. 50%. This is quite an astonishing uh, finding. It suggests that for half the society, the very notion of economic growth or of economic progress is actually not a, a credible uh, concept fundamentally. So I think that when, uh, and when it's not as pronounced in the UK, but the idea that something like GDP and the macroeconomics 
uh, are plausible ways of winning public arguments when 50% of your society uh, have not actually been having any kind of benefit from, from these, from these uh, forms of progress, I think needs to be taken seriously. I think also, and this kind of relates partly to some of what Glenn was saying, is that I think we need to see that since the 1970s, the geography of, of progress uh, has, has changed in, in key ways. Um, now, it was interesting, actually, the, the map of the regions of, you know, the way in which the, 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 the universities display things in regions. But initially and fundamentally, statistics are tools of centralized nation states to represent nations. Um, and in many ways, the forms of economic uh, and social progress that have, been, uh, uh, that have been most pronounced since the 1970s have not been national in any, in any meaningful sense. They have been based around uh, nation, uh, based around uh, large cities so in the, you, you know London um, New York uh, San Francisco and so on um, and I mean there's a interesting uh, in Neil Brenner's work on, on on state space he talks about how the Keynesian state until the 1970s you could think of the way in which the Keynesian state related to the nation as spreading butter on a piece of toast and that this was the part of the and of course the new labor did some of this with their sort of uh, public uh, back sort of their, their their public spending decisions and their tax credits and so on but the the ideology of neoliberalism is that you back your most competitive spaces whether that be Cambridge London Oxford and so on and that there will be a kind of spatial trickle down effect but which doesn't necessarily reach all spaces. This problem is far more pronounced in the United States, which is why you know the, the, the phenomenon of the Trump supporters in Ohio and so on uh, was so important. But the, in some ways, the geography of capitalism uh, represents a direct threat to uh, some of the kind of organizing power of statistics in, in everyday life. Alain de Rosier uses this, this very nice phrase to describe what statistics do, or statistics, how does statistics hold together? And they hold together because they have a common sense of nationality, common notions of, of methodology, common notions of of shared uh, progress that everybody within the unit of the nation state is uh, inhabiting a similar sociological reality that is moving forward together. This is a kind of an enlightenment ideal of, of statistics and that in some ways it's been broken by uh, the changing geography of capitalism in the last, of the last 40 years. Um, I also, this is something which I, I kind of floated this idea in the, in the Guardian piece and I'm not sure exactly, I'm going to float it again just in case it sort of <laughs> can help the discussion but some of what Glenn said actually makes me wonder about it a bit but is whether um, uh, in some ways, many of our, of our, of our defining uh, social problems of our times are, are questions of intensity of emotion rather than extensity of, 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 of uh, characteristics across a population. So uh, you think of problems of underemployment rather than problems of unemployment. Uh, the very notion of unemployment, which came into existence before the First World War, to what extent does a concept such as unemployment, which is a binary question, are you looking for work or are you in work, uh, or are you sort of outside of the labour market? To what extent does this kind of concept capture uh, the changing nature of the labour market uh, in times of people with underemployment, people with uh, very complex um, moving in and out of the labour market? And I'm sure statistics, statisticians have got all sorts of things to say about this, but I think that there are uh, ways in which um, some of our, our headline indicators about the economy um, have changed, um, uh, sorry, are, are put under strain by uh, the greater fluidity, changing forms of identity, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the different, the, the, the dissolution of, of more simple categories of the d defined uh, uh, social and economic life under what was, was called Fordism up until the, uh, the, the 1970s. Um, and I think in some respects, and this is where Dominic Cummings' work for the Vote Leave campaign is quite interesting, is that in some respects polling, uh, and again, Glenn would know more about this than me, but in some ways, you know, to what extent can polling capture uh, how strongly people feel about issues, which Dominic Cummings recognised was absolutely crucial for winning the uh, referendum for Leave, uh, was because um, people were more hostile to, the, the, the Leave voters were more hostile to Europe than Remain voters were uh, in love with Europe, um, and that this has certain effects on turnout and so on. So if, if we live in a kind of, you know, what Colin Crouch has called a, a post-democratic age, the question of how you can sort of infuse people to actually go and vote at all in that respect uh, becomes key. Now, I'm sure there are all sorts of technical ways of dealing with that, but th that this is at least uh, a sign of some of the, the, the problems that, that face um, uh, these, these quantitative methods today. Now, so the question then is, what, how, do we describe, how do we understand the regime of numbers that is uh, replacing it? Now, the obvious answer, which Daniel mentioned at the beginning, is big data and algorithms. And of course, everything, big data and algorithms. Now, there were lots of um, things to, the, lots of paranoia and excitement and mixture of the two about big data and algorithms at the moment. There, we've had the whole panic surrounding, did Cambridge Analytica win 
uh, the uh, election for Donald Trump because it was able to do um, uh, not just psychological profiling but um, uh, influencing uh, across uh, uh, across populations in ways that people weren't even aware of. Um, and uh, the Observer's been dig digging into some of this stuff with Robert Mercer and SEL Group and so on. Um, there is obviously ways in which traditional technocratic institutions such as the Bank of England can also draw on big data. The Bank of England now uses uh, Google Trends in its economic forecasting, so there's no reason why the institutions that emerged in that late 17th century period, including the Bank of England, which was another legacy of that, of that period, couldn't innovate and reinvent themselves in ways that takes advantage of, of, of big data and, and, and algorithmic search. And uh, um, after my article was written in the, um, the Guardian in January, there was a rather frosty letter from the national statistician saying that, um, you know, that things, were, things had never been better for the Office of National Statistics uh, because they, ha they, had, uh, they, had, they now had data as well as traditional statistical methods. And I, I, had, I wasn't actually disagreeing with that, but it was, it was a strangely defensive um, uh, letter. Um, but, um, and then there is, of course, the, I think above all, and I know this is partly what, what this project is con concerned with, is, is, is the question of the, um, the, 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 public the, the accountability of the data brokers. Uh, you know, who, who are the people in the Frank's work on this as well. The, the, um, the, the, we don't know who these people are. We don't know how they're collecting. We don't know what they're doing with it. Um, and they don't have to ask permission to do it. They don't have any ethics committees. They don't have any, uh, you know, it's not even clear kind of, you know, what, what sort of training is going on. So those are, there are lots of things I can say about that. And, and p people here are better qualified to talk about it. But I want to just identify some of the kind of formal properties of numbers. Because I think that we can try and distinguish between different uh, uh, characteristics of these different re regimes of numbers, um, the, the first being the one of the, the late 17th century and the second, second one being this one which actually emerged before the birth of digital technology, I would argue. It's actually a fundamentally, it's a managerial approach to numbers um, and it's a corporate approach to numbers that, of course, with the birth of cybernetics and computing uh, in the post-war era has uh, kind of acquired the capacity to govern us on a more, in a more public way or a more social way with the rise of social media platforms and so on, but that the style and the approach to numbers uh, was born much earlier. Now, the first thing to say about these numbers is that uh, these are numbers which uh, uh, seek to facilitate real-time decision-making rather than conclusive decision-making. Um, the point of a uh, number... Uh, as produced in, uh, with, with a statistical quality, it has a kind of juridical capacity. It seeks to settle an argument. It seeks to offer a conclusive account. Of course, you can revise GDP numbers and so on, but it is that its function is to achieve social peace, to achieve some kind of resolution or conclusion. Um, this is also partly a, a, the kind of argument that, that um, people like Laurent Thévenot and people in this, the, 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 the um, uh, French convention theory school that Derosier was also part of uh, are interested in. Whereas managerial knowledge is much more focused upon achieving real-time uh, decision-making. Um, and the function is to find numbers through which one can, can react to changing circumstances rather than to achieve some kind of objective, conclusive account of what those circumstances are. So this, in a sense, is also another dimension to something that is what you could call post-representational, because the function is not to achieve a, uh, a, a, an accurate, stable account of how things are, uh, but to achieve something that is as up to the minute that you can react to it in ways that gives you strategic advantage over others uh, uh, and that you know about it before other people, you know about it before it's too late, and so on. Now, evidence that this is, um, it predates digital technology is things like, which I mentioned earlier, the, the birth of market research uh, in the uh, statistical market research in the late 19th century. Um, uh, in some ways, polling, which comes out of market research, the rise, the rise of, is the, rise, the notion of attitudinal surveys in the, in the 1920s that were developed for the likes of J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency to go and understand um, uh, audiences um, and uh, radio audiences, um, uh, uh, consumer markets, and so on. And it's the adaptation of that towards political voting preferences uh, that uh, gives us the birth of polling. Gallup took those techniques and uh, began to apply it to uh, uh, the questions of public opinion. And Roosevelt, who was a huge consumer of those polls in the 1930s, uh, partly because of fear of socialism, partly because the you know sense of was the New Deal actually kind of legitimate or not, um, you know was using them not to sort of get to try and grasp get some grasp on sort of the truth, but partly to try and maintain some semblance of control. So to use um, uh, as Angus Bergen's 
foot on what's it called the um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the control revolution. Um, do I mean Angus Bergen? I think I've got the name. Anyway, the control revolution is the book. It's a brilliant history of these techniques that developed um, uh, from uh, really with the r rise of the railroads uh, in the mid 19th century in America, which developed, which created the need for techniques of knowledge uh, accumulation, which were uh, about the capacity to coordinate in real time rather than to gain uh, kind of a sort of stable objective representation. If you also think of something like the audience worm, you know, the way in which that 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 sort of became a kind of paradigmatic. Uh, uh, way of, of, of relating to politics, of sort of seeing constant, you know, if I do that, how do people respond? If I do that, how do people respond? And constantly being able to adapt one's behavior around responses. So a constant sort of interactivity and reactivity that digital technology has, has made uh, possible, but, um, but did, not give, did not give birth to, I would argue. Um, the second feature of these, these numbers is that in some ways they are, um, to, to speak kind of conceptually about this, these are tools of what you could call sensation, sens tools of sensation rather than tools of representation. They are ways, which is a kind of another way of saying the same thing, they are ways of detecting what is going on. Um, now you can, you know, if you look at things like wearable technology and this quantified self uh, activities of the present, um, this is, um, in, in some ways gives a demonstration of this, that the point of those sorts of devices is not to sort of build up some sort of mirror or, or some sort of um, a set of objective facts about who one is, uh, but to uh, be able to adapt one's behavior um, so that you get feedback on uh, everyday situations that you can adapt to. Now, that's not necessarily, you know, you, maybe you could do it in a more kind of artistic way to try and paint a picture of oneself, but these are uh, technologies which use numbers to enable uh, reactivity and change of, change of path and so on. Um, sentiment analysis uh, as a tool of, of market research as conducted by social media platforms and so on, which is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, sentiment analysis refers to uh, effectively forms of um, uh, machine learning where computers learn to interpret the emotional value of different words. Now you can do it manually actually. You can take sort of 3,000 words like good, bad, horrible, crap, whatever, and give each of them a score between plus five and minus five uh, and then uh, feed billions of, 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 of bytes of, of Twitter data into a machine and it can tell kind of different forms of mood in, in relation to different uh, uh, other words such as Donald Trump or Coca-Cola or something like this. But this is um, a, a, a means of detection, a means of sensation, not really a means of, 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 of developing the type of uh, a, a portrait of a society or of a state of affairs uh, that was the problem that the likes of William Petty and John Grant and others were, were, were grappling with in the late uh, 17th century. It's not about building a, a, a stable picture, it's about supporting uh, reactivity and decision making. Now, um, now, there's interesting kind of hybrid examples of this. You know, the, anyone who's an academic uh, sort of has to live in fear of the National Student Survey, which is in some ways a kind of partly sort of sensation, partly representation, because it has a, a kind of, uh, you know, you get your score that you carry around with you for the year, uh, but part of the, the function of these sorts of tools is to enable universities to sort of adapt their behavior um, uh, uh, to, uh, around um, uh, 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 this, this kind of feedback. Now, so of course there are sort of, sort of hybrids between the two, but you could say, if you'll excuse the, the sort of sociological language, you could say that there are two sort of ideal types. So that in some ways, one set of one regime of numbers aspires uh, to the uh, uh, to, to, to a, um, an ideal of accuracy and, rep and representation, and one and another aspires to an ideal of, of, of responsiveness. Now, I would say that this this the, these tools of sensation lend themselves to populism uh, in all manner of ways uh, because they firstly they enable. Uh, 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 centers of power to become more in touch with feelings, uh, as the example of sentiment analysis uh, indicates. They don't purport to speak for people, which is exactly what the populist reaction is against. The populist reaction is against the right of journalists, social scientists, economists, politicians, all these people to speak on their behalf. People want to express, they want to feel, they want their feelings to be taken into account, but they don't want them to be uh, uh, represented by some delegate or some expert or something like that. Uh, and in some ways, these, these tools lend themselves to, uh, to the populist moment in that respect. I want to just, I want to end um, by giving an example that takes us right back to the, to the heart of this post-truth um, kind of populist moment as it's being tagged, which is um, one of the most ridiculous moments in, um, in, in Trump's quite ridiculous uh, few months, which was um, happened on the day one of his presidency, which was the argument about the size of his crowd at his inauguration. Um, and this is where Kellyanne Conway's um, phrase, uh, alternative facts, was coined. 
She said, so Trump said there were 1.8 million people at his inauguration. Um, uh, people in the New York Times were saying there were half a million people at his inauguration. Um, and there was an argument which went on. Um, Sean Spicer had this ridiculous press conference where he said, um, you know, it's possible to disagree with the facts. Kellyanne Conway said that she had alternative facts. Trump said that they were just demeaning me. They are, you know, they're out to get me. And he said, I've got a photo that will prove to you that actually it was bigger than in Obama's inauguration crowd. Now, of course, it's easy for all of us to sort of, you know, this is, this, it was sort of high comedy in some respects. But I think in order to understand what's going on with numbers right now and, it's, and, and the populist um, context of, of, of a new uh, style of, of quantification, um, it, um, that in some respects, Trump and co. were right. Because, so the first thing to, to, to know about this debate is that the, the Parks Authority in Washington, D.C. does not offer official estimates of the size of the crowd any longer. They haven't done it since 1995 because there was the uh, Louis Farrakhan's Million Man March um, happened in Washington, D.C., and the Parks Authority said there were 400,000 people there. And for obvious reasons, this was a politically divisive thing to do. They don't do it any longer. But one of the reasons they don't do it as well is that the margin of error in an area such as crowd estimation um, is extremely high. It's, um, I mean, even with William and Kate's um, uh, wedding, the, the estimates were all over the place. They were sort of 1.8 million down to sort of 300,000 or something. I mean, it's, it's extremely difficult to get a handle on a crowd. And in some respects, you could say that this, this is a feature, not a bug, for someone like Trump. This is one of the reasons why, and he's lied about the size of his crowds a, a lot, but it's not clear because there are no authorities on, on crowd size. There are people who specialize in crowd size estimation using satellite imagery and so on, but the methods are very, very, um, uh, 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 very, very um, uh, uh, uncertain. Um, and there is always a problem with crowds of perspectivism, which is depending on where you're standing. Now, of course, if you're in the satellite, it looks different. But you know, we're spending, and this, you see this with with, with Corbyn um, uh, uh, photography of, of rallies and so on. People kind of going, showing a huge rally from the middle of it, and saying, and they say he's unelectable. You know, as if this this sort of huge emotional crowd is a kind of substitute for the ballot box in some ways. Um, but it's partly one of the one of the uh, appeals of a crowd from the populist perspective is precisely that experts can't quite get their hands uh, around this type of object. Um, and one of the ways in which it's most likely that they will do that in the future is uh, the rise of smart cities. Um, now, smart cities, as the digital as the urban environment becomes uh, uh, sensitive in, in, in ways, it, it becomes an environment that is uh, uh, becomes uh, 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 designed for data capture. Of course, it will become possible to generate more and more numbers. But one of the questions I just want to leave you with is, will those kinds of numbers actually settle these kinds of arguments? Or will they actually provoke a whole new set of arguments? Because in some respects, the types of, uh, uh, of quantification, the types of numbers that smart environments uh, provoke uh, are as to create further questions about, well, what time do you, uh, are you going for? Because these, are, these are infrastructures are all about trying to sense surges, flows, uh, rise and fall of crowds and so on, or whatever it might be, equally to you know, quantified self uh, technologies are about trying to track uh, trends and so on. In their real-time uh, sensitivity, their capacity to actually generate what Mary Poovey would ca call the modern fact, the type of evidence that was indisputable, actually uh, is, is, is uh, uh, um, uh, threatened in its own way. So that we might have a future where populist figures uh, uh, and their critics are able to point towards forms of numbers that are generated in real time by uh, the everyday uh, uh, physical and, and social environment. But I think the idea that this is going to achieve the same types of resolution of, of public argument that uh, statistics of that 17th century variety did, I think remains open to question because uh, the very nature of those numbers is, is, uh, is uh, the very, the, 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 the very uh, character of those numbers is all uh, geared towards uh, facilitating reactivity uh, and, uh, uh, and, and real-time sensitivity, not towards uh, a sort of factual, stable representation of things. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for that tour de force, um, really, summarising summarizing so many of the, the big questions um, that have brought us all here. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to just start with one little question to try and see if I can tease out some of the things that um, ran across your two, your two talks there. Just this question of demand that Glenn sort of was just talking about, this idea of demand side 
explanations of stats. Um, presumably underlying that is some idea of curiosity that these kind of things are trying to serve. Um, and I just wondered how that kind of curiosity for mm. information and knowledge would sit with Will's, I suppose, account of this kind of scepticism about something like a GDP figure. I mean, it's not as if there's a kind of Cartesian doubt that mm. GDP really exists. But as you outlined, there is a kind of um, scepticism perhaps about the classification that went on behind mm. GDP, which clashes with um, people's real world experience or something of that nature. So I just wondered if either of you could reflect maybe on that potential tension there between, I suppose, this desire for um, knowledge on the one hand that Glenn's talked about, and this kind of, I suppose, reflex against it. Well, I mean, it's partly different populations. I mean, I, I had a bizarre experience, well, it wasn't a bizarre experience, but it was something which I noticed recently, where everybody I knew on Facebook and Twitter was all sharing an identical uh, info infographic from the FT, which basically showed that the UK's, you know, wage growth was far, far worse than anywhere else in Europe. And this is because my friends are sort of left wing and don't like austerity and, you know, don't like Tories and that sort of stuff. And they all, it was everywhere. And I was sort of thinking to myself, you know, I could almost like map my own social network by who is sharing this infographic at this moment. Um, and it's sort of like there's different info. I mean, infographics are a big part of uh, are a big part of the, the sort of part of this problem in a way because they render numbers aesthetic. And uh, I didn't go and check the methodology of this graph. I don't think any other of my friends had. It would be, I mean, this is what the fake news panic was about, really, was things that look like uh, object, things that have, a, have an aesthetic of objectivity, um, but frankly, they're just JPEGs floating around on the internet. Um, and that's, um, you know, this is, a, this is a problem. So, of course, there's a demand for, um, for, for numbers, and I've no doubt that people in the completely different area of the social media forest from me, which I... I know nothing about and who are being targeted in completely different ways by political parties and all that kind of stuff. No doubt there are infographics circulating in those social media sort of networks as well, which are completely different and they show different sorts of things. Um, so the demand is there, but I suppose the question then is, you know, to what extent are we witnessing a sort of fracturing of, of, of that public demand such that people's curiosity is towards different sorts of things? And of course there is, I think, partly a you know, a sense, go back to the immigration question, um, British Futures, which I, I mentioned this a bit in my, my Guardian piece, British Futures, which is a think tank uh, which aims to try and understand more healthy ways of talking about immigration in the UK, um, they did some, some focus groups on how to win arguments about immigration with people who were sceptical. And they found that qualitative evidence, whether that be stories of happily settled migrants, you know, um, possibly slightly jingoistic pictures of migrants with you know, bunting and drinking tea and that sort of stuff. But, you know, the, the, the qualitative uh, could had a kind of capacity to win certain arguments in a much more uh, comprehensive way than the quantitative because certain numbers on certain issues seem to alienate people quite, quite explicitly. And I think, I mean, Clinton probably had a similar problem with her sort of technocratic demeanor in the U.S. election. So the question is, you know, yes, there's demand for, 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 for data and, and numbers and so on, but it's clustered in certain cultural communities now um, and if you assume, which I suppose was the mistake that Osborne and Cameron made in holding a referendum on the European Union, if you assume that your cultural cluster, uh, as, uh, sort of credi uh, the, the, the credibility of those numbers in your cl cultural cluster has universal credibility, which was the sort of enlightenment um, uh, ideal, then you, you might turn out to be very much mistaken. Now, I don't know quite what the answer to that is, but um, yeah. I suppose what I'd say about that is that although I was relatively provocatively emphasising the demand side, clearly, even though there's got to be demand for new forms of figuring numbers for them to be called forth, that's the kind of economic view of it, the ideas side and the debate side still got to be in that story, hasn't it? Because, for instance, that Keynesian identity, that Keynesian national accounting frame was intensely controversial and only really ruled the roost in a quite a, a, a fused way with a, with a different set of American ideas for a very short time, for sort of 15 20 to 25 years. When Keynes talked about the general theory in the 30s, it was controversial because people from left and right said there isn't such a thing as a single autarkic numerated economy. GDP doesn't exist. <laughs> so clearly ideas, and in, in that sense the idea of the nation, as an economic identity are very, very important. So mm. they have to also, to change my analogy, change my kind of image, 
They also have to fall on fertile ground, ideally, or they just die. So the fact that Keynes uh, came out with the single national accounts framework, and that was then worked on by the people in the Second World War, the fact that there's depression, stagnation, and war <laughs> is demand side, but it also uh, buckles the idea structure because people think in national ways in the 20s and 40s, yeah. um, and less uh, less regional, uh, less city region, mm -hmm. less individual ways. So the idea, yeah, you're right. The ideas frame is also very important. Yeah, I mean, there was, sorry, just to one, say one more thing. I mean, there was the whole notion of mass society that, that between the First World War and the 1960s, this idea that the, which generated all of this, I mean, this was partly why, where notions of propaganda come from, is how do you govern mass society? That was what Bernays was, was, was grappling with. But there was, you know, in sociology, there was things like the, you know, the Midtown uh, studies in America, and people, people were... Um, very interested in what was average, what was what was the average way of life in this nation, and it was partly um, a, a symptom of the, the origins of consumerism, but it was also, you know, world war and so on. So the, the 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 question of who we are in the aggregate was something that had a lot of public uh, interest during the during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and it's really this, the you know in market research the development of these clusters of A1, A2. B1, B2, B3, emerges in the wake of 1960s identity politics. But until, until then, um, you know, the question of what, what does the mass want, what does everyone think, was a, was a sort of question that nowadays we wouldn't consider to be a meaningful question to ask, but it was during that time. What I would say about ideas is that they are often, strangely, they're often very vague or very far away from stats. The ideas that govern whether you take on different forms of statistical thinking, or strangely, are quite deep-seated. So to go back to my Keynesian uh, analogy uh, example earlier, lots of people oppose Keynes because they say you're trying to manage society and I want to transform the structure of the economy. Now that is associated with your, your emotional views and we just mm -hmm. had a lot of literature about emotional views of the economy and how we, we perceive the economy. It's not necessarily associated with your grasp of or view of stats directly, it comes from somewhere else. I'm guessing there's lots of questions going on. So, we're just going to come to this place, right? I guess the start us off, and then I've got a list of other things. So, yeah, um, go ahead. Um, just to ask both uh, speakers, um, is there a crisis of statistics? Or is there a crisis of, statistics of states mm. and politicians? It's completely different. The statistics starts off as the, the, the numbering of states, but statistics are the a numbering has escaped from a socialist state. There's lots and lots and lots of statistics which people accept all the time, which have nothing to do with states, company accounts, <laughs> stock markets, exchange rates, the relationship with demography and pensions, credit ratings, house prices, all these things. People accept them. So is it not a question of statistics, but a question of states and, um, and, and politicians? I'm, uh, the answer is I'm not sure, because if we look at trust in politicians, although we, can, we think of politicians as uniquely, or perhaps we think of them as at a very low ebb, actually they've not fallen very far from where they were in the 80s and early 90s. So we see in the 80s politicians very low ebb, then there's the uh, uh, five, six, seven year period of Blair Brown where politicians are more respected, more trusted. Then it goes down in late Blair Brown and, and then falls away. This is you'll see in the UK. So I'm not sure about that in that I, I think that Brits, and there's lots of evidence about this in the post-war period, they were always very sceptical of government and political statistics. You know, so grassroots consumer movements under Attlee didn't trust Labour stats at all under, in the late 40s about rationing. They said, in a very similar way, and you see in climate change, in climate change resistors now, no, you're lying you're giving the food to Labour voters, or whatever. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. And I certainly don't think that we're living in a unique period where people don't trust politicians. I think that's not changed vastly. I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying, and, and this is, in some ways my, my sort of thesis was sort of along those lines. Um, I mean, it's interesting when you think about those other numbers you've just named. They tend to be about facilitating peer-to-peer -peer trust. So you can't, you know, in order for the housing market to work or for investment to work and so on, people need these 
um, the, the, these intermediaries, which of course, so those, the, the, the crisis of the, those intermediaries have, have obviously suffered their own dire crisis in the last 10 years, but the, the financial crisis was caused primarily by a failure of accurate pricing and credit rating. So it's not that those things are, are, are immune to, I mean, they have, they have in some ways much more sort of devastating and rapid forms of, 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 of legitimacy crises. Um, but I, otherwise, I, I generally agree. I mean, I think that, I, I'm not sure I think it's politicians themselves not being trusted, but I think that states are no longer engaged in the same kinds of, well, Keynesian types of um, state-led national economic management that renders these representations credible. So, um, you know, to, like, one, when the economy is being run in a sort of post-statistical fashion around uh, support from, for the most competitive regions rather than for the, for the nation as a whole, then, of course, the, the, the credibility of these, of these forms of, 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 of representation will, will go into demise. And in some ways, I think, you know, if you look at the history of, of, of neoliberal thought, the likes of Hayek and these sorts of figures, Milton Friedman and others, part of what they were hell-bent on doing was destroying the credibility of, of state knowledge. I mean, they wanted the market to become a better barometer of the truth than experts working for central governments, and that, and so the mark, so those, it's, it's not incidental that you know that financial markets have sort of prospered in their kind of credibility, for better or worse, at a time when possibly sort of technocrats have, have fallen down. I've got one from Liz. Right, two really quick questions. Um, one is very provocative, but I think this is mainly for Will, but may, maybe you two can add something. I'm really interested in the idea of this aesthetics of objectivity and how um, mm. big data maybe facilitates an aesthetics of objectivity. But in terms of what you're arguing about the modern fact, mm. I mean, my reading of Kubi and people like Ted Clover is the modern fact achieves this currency of a particular rhetorical accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. But you sound like, and I, I haven't worked this out at all, it sounds like you're implying something different is going on here. The, the, this, there's more, more rhetoric and less fact. Um, because I, I, I can't help think about Florence Nightingale's rose diagrams and the way in which stats have always needed that particular kind of aesthetics in order mm. to do anything in the world. Um, but, but now we're in a place where you can do that kind of aesthetic manipulation. Mm. Much more to it. What is what you're describing a continuum of the Sure, yeah. So, um, and it's true that, I mean, these early statisticians like Petty and others were some ways often tr trying to look more objective than they could actually be because there was a sort of a, um, they, they were sort of trying to look, it was sort of cool in a way that big data is now. Um, and um, I suppose, in a way, then the question is, what, is, what, is the, what are the mechanisms of transparency that surround these numbers? Um, and um, yes, I'm just, I, haven't, I haven't quite thought, you're, you're making a very good point, I haven't quite sort of thought, thought through this, this answer, but I think that this in some ways takes us back to the question of, of the secrecy that surrounds the generation of, of, of data uh, and the ownership of that data as a, as a private asset that is there for competitive advantage rather than for the resolution of, of public arguments. Um, and that this is, um, is this, 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 you know, that, that difference generates a completely different culture of transparency and publicity around things like methodologies, um, around publication of books. Um, there was, I mean, also in Poovey's book, he talks about, you know, I mean, of course, it was a very restricted, you know, liberal elite that was doing all of this, so the publicness of it was much, you know, um, open to question, but the, 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 the publication of numbers and the, 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 um, the need to kind of impress people by constantly being as, as, as public as you could with your books, your methods, and so on, is something that I think, uh, but I, I, I can see, I'm not quite sure exactly how my, my, my argument deals with the, you know, clearly there was a rhetorical and aesthetic dimension to that as well. Can I just come in on the aesthetic, which is that the aesthetic is appropriate to, again, to the demand for what, what people want. So the form I would uh, single out would be the kind of the time series graph in the post-war, a period where growth would be stable, progress would be stable, progress broadly defined, and therefore you'd have a 10, 15, 20 year time series graph, both into past and to future. So you can see how the aesthetic matches the demand for policy making structure, or indeed matches the way people imagine. 
in the 70s, it matches the way people imagine because there's all these figures, these graphs of declines. There's fish stocks decline, or oil pollution, or raw material use. And then there's that whole crisis of governability and environmental governability. So the aesthetic, to me, matches the ideological feel of the time. Thank you. Okay, so I've got just wearing a green shirt. Yeah, it, it, as you go from, the, let's say, the pamphlet hearing age to the age of mass communications to the age of the internet, you know, maybe roughly uh, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century, if you, if you will, um, do you see the change in evolution in, in your, you know, you're looking at numbers and statistics uh, and the the way they are perceived by the public. I mean, certainly when you had a, a Walter Cronkite era of, of, of mass communication where you had everybody sort of exposed to the same information, it's radically different in these days, like what Target or, or uh, 19th century of pamphlet hearing where there's millions of different sources. Well, what's interesting is that I think there's, there's always been a segmented audience for numbers. So as usual, I'm, I'm keen as a historian not to exaggerate the change because these things are, you know, these things are rather more long, long run than we often think. So if we look at uh, pamphlets for uh, insurance for industrial workers in the late 19th century, you know, how, how much do you have to pay in to get a certain amount of insurance? That's quite a segmented market, for instance, in, in 1890, or parents or voters. Uh, I went to a paper a few weeks ago about uh, voters in the London elections in, 19, in the early 1900s, about how much you're paying for the rates and how much is going into schools. Targeted parents. So we've always had segmented markets. I think they're radically accelerated now. Mm. And as we all say, you know, Crosby Texter and the Conservatives are spending in the 2015 election, millions and millions of pounds on targeted Facebook by postcode. Facebook advice by postcode, which the national electoral legislation struggles to keep up with, because that's counted as national, and really that's going into single seats. In that case, Liberal Democrat seats in the South West, of which they turn all of them over, purely by spending all that money on Facebook. Mm. Yeah, sorry, just behind you. Um, in the interest of balancing, can I just uh, state the following, please? The act of voting is ultimately an ontological decision process. In this context, statistics or even facts are two-dimensional in the big picture of emotional awareness and inspirational goals. A populist position has therefore a greater depth of validity in the real world. Democracy is one person, one vote, whether you like the result or not. I think that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, I, I think... I mean, I mean, I think I, I, I just, and my talk just ended defending Donald Trump. So, I mean, like, you know, saying that actually, you know, there are some things which actually can't be amenable to fact, and actually things like crowds, are, uh, you know, there are there is a, there is an aspect of politics that escapes the the statistical and the and the positivist. So, I mean, I, you know, I I, I don't think I, any of them here has has has, um, has we're not here to, to to beat up on populism particularly. No, I think the fact is that... Um, was, really? Yeah. Well, I, I hope not, so, cause, because actually I agree, with, I agree with what you're saying, in that um, the emotional decision of voting is much more important. We have a vast amount. If we're talking just about voting, let's just narrow in on yeah. voting, we have a huge amount of evidence of, for instance, voters' perceptions of leaders, which are formed very, very quickly, uh, within microseconds sometimes, which is way below the frame in which we absorb numbers in terms of, well, way below or way above, but way away from the way we look at tables and charts. And it is in part an emotional decision. So voters who uh, will often agree with what a leader will say won't hear it. And again, we look at focus groups, we have a lot of evidence of that because they've already ruled that person out of bounds as having no credibility emotionally. So if, we, if I've given you that impression, we've given you that impression. I, I, and I mean, I and I was, what I was trying to do was to try and understand and exp or give, a, give, an, give an explanation, partly for, for why 
because after all, the shock of something like Brexit or Trump, and suddenly, well, people in Portsmouth, Ohio, or in Merthyr Tydfil, Wales, were voting against their interests. You know, that was the immediate liberal technocratic response. And it is a, it is a demand placed on all of us as social sciences, scientists to do better than that response, to actually to understand and to accept to, and, to, and to get beyond what was basically the sort of governing framework of Clintonite Democrats and Blairite New Labour for, for sort of 20 years, and maybe still is in, in some respects, which is that people should basically just do what our model says in their interest. So I was trying to understand that there was an aspect to, to politics that is not being grasped by statistics today, but potentially could be grasped by some of these new data capture technologies, particularly where they're focused on things like emotion and... and uh, uh, and, and, and forms of behavior that um, do not get captured so well by traditional statistics. To use the word shock, and that's for the criticism of an elitist viewpoint. The people who then, actually voted. There was a the shock. The, the, shock he, the shock happened. There was a shock. So David Cameron must have been very shocked. The people who, the majority who wanted something, it wasn't a shock to them. Okay, so we'll, that's true. we'll, we'll take that board and we're going to move on to say just you. It was against the polls, anyway, so. That's right. So what we, what we look, when we look at polling, although the evidence for it is quite fragmentary, the effect of polling. So, for instance, we look at the 2010 election, we have a big Lib Dem bubble, which to me looks rather like this uh, surge, and it just pops in the polling booth. So, actually, these dynamic effects, which you're talking about, are often quite limited. There's certainly a lot of evidence that there's no such thing as momentum forgive the pun, <laughs> in, 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 in that, in that if, the, the, if, in the, if the polling moves in one direction, the association with strength, the strength of that they'll continue is very, very low. So effectively we can see a zigzag. And we can see that in the Conservative vote in this election, which shoots up at the announcement of the election and now rather droops slightly. So there's no association really with one going up to continue to go up. So there is, there is evidence of that, but it's, it's quite limited in terms of uh, creating a sense that, oh, we're on the way. So, um, what was I going to say that, about that as well? Which is, oh yeah, of course, that can work in two directions. Because, of course, the image that Labour can win in this election will do two dynamic things. It will mean that wavering Labour voters who don't like Corbyn may break off because they will say, oh, I was going to vote Labour to make sure they didn't collapse. I didn't want him to win, number one. And number two, it will energise older voters who this movement terrifies, effectively. So it, won't, it has those effects you're talking about, but it also has other effects which are often unintended or uh, unexpected. OK, thanks. I'm going to move on quickly, so I've got one just in front of me. Just uh, one thing. I mean, this, this is a, a, a session on, on numbers and statistics. Um, have either of you engaged with mathematicians at all? In, in, and I, I think the presence more than the room broadly as well. I mean... What sort of engagement do you have with, with, with the people who are actually churning out uh, the, the, the results, the products that you're now analysing and discussing? I mean, I, I, I've sort of studied economists, actually, uh, in an empirical sense, um, but I've never, I've never had any contact with sort of trained professional mathematicians, I have to say. Right. No, uh, we had statisticians to our conference that created the book that you, the, the Theodore Porter chapter is in, so with statisticians I have, and mine, again, is usually with economists. Mine, of course, is, as you can tell, with pollsters. So we work, I suppose what we're saying is we work with practitioners mm -hmm. rather than pure math <coughs> people. But it's good, you're right. I mean, I'll raise two points. One was that you, you brought up Cambridge Analytica, mm -hmm. um, which is completely populated by mathematicians, mm -hmm. literally a small group of mathematical mercenaries sure. uh, doing, do, doing that work. Secondly, you mentioned that the, the GFC was caused primarily by incorrect pricing of financial products. Mm. Now, that's a pretty big problem. Mm. And that, 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 if it's true what you say, that that is the primary cause, um, it's, again, mathematicians yeah. who, who, who are doing that work. 
Um, so I'm just a bit surprised that, 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 that you say there's practically no interaction or engagement with, with, with mathematicians, given that they are, I mean, this is a numbers and public interest, right? You probably want to talk to people who are on the ground level, the, the gatekeepers to, 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 to this data information. Um, it, it seems... Which is probably well, a, good, the, really the, the, the is, yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I think you make a good point. Um, and in a way, it's a criticism of the event. Um, I did try to get some statisticians here, several who were unable to join us. So that is something I probably take the blame for. But no, I appreciate the. Well, there's no criticism of the event. It's like asking mm. how, how, how you can sort of keep, keep doing this analysis without. I mean, it's a question for the two of you again. How you can do this analysis without actually having long, deep discussions with the mathematicians doing this stuff. Well, I, I think my interest is in, is in statistics of the state. So interacting with economists and, and pollsters is what, is what I'm interested in. But you, you make a point which I have considered before, and I think it's right, that I probably should, we as a group, and I mean historians and social scientists, we should probably be more mathematically enabled. Because I'm stats enabled, I have a kind of master's in economic history, but I'm not as maths enabled as I would like to be. So I suppose what I'm doing is accepting your criticism, but saying, you know, kind of, like all economics, our time and our, our energy is limited. Mm. I mean, in a way, let's not clean ourselves up too much, because there's, <laughs> there's a limit to the extent I'm of I'm prepared to beat myself well. up, but how am I from actually like? It's fine. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so I've got, I've got a list, so if everyone could just be brief in their questions, because we're running out of time slightly. John wants to... Well, just, I just want to come back on, on, on that particular question, because um, I, I would disagree with the characterization of the roots of the financial crisis as being made at the... At the feet of mathematicians. I mean, at the, the, at the root of this, the political economy of, of the crisis was ab about, uh, about banks, which do, of course, employ mathematicians. It's partly about the way in which a particular economic formula was used to, to estimate the risk of, of, of derivatives. But that's, that's a relatively small part of the story, I would say. A much bigger part of the story is, is the way in which a group of institutions uh, discovered that if they, if they, they could pr construct a kind of uh, derivative product which, which bundled bad risks with good risks and then uh, corrupt rating agencies which, which uh, for reasons that, that you don't need to be a mathematician to understand, um, but they, they then uh, rated these, these derivatives as being secure products and so on. So the political economy of what happened involves mathematics, but only, I would say, <laughs> in a minor role. Um, what? The, the bigger point I want to make is that, is that at, at, at every step that you've described there, you have large numbers of mathematicians doing incredibly complicated things. And, and, and they are doing every single piece of work that allows them to progress to the next step. The mathematicians are completely central in this. Not, not in relation to collateralized debt obligations. They, cre they, they, they created them, they, 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 they priced them, they, they rated them, they, 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 they were completely central. They didn't buy them, the rest of the public bought them, but they were the ones that, that, that created these tools and, and sent them out into, into society. Well, you know, I think, did John have another important question he wanted to know? Yeah, yeah, you know like, well, simply about what, what I've noticed myself in the, in, in the big data world, because I do know some of these people, um, is, is that there's a strange kind of illusion that, that large-scale uh, large -scale data gives you a kind of omniscience mm -hmm. that's not available um, to, to, to the collection of, of statistical ways. For example, some, some of these people say that the way in which we manage our, our, our affairs is a bit like driving by looking only through the rearview mirror. The rearview mirror providing the traditional statistics that we're used to. And that because we, we have the capability to gather real-time information, that we, in my opinion, that's a failure to distinguish between on one hand politics, which is about the acquisition of power and the arguments that go on in order to acquire it on the one hand. And, and uh, as it were, government or the implementation of power, which is a managerial perspective. And that's at the root of some of this stuff. I think. Okay, I'd just like to get a few more voices in. I've got Trent Holm. Uh, and, and, and sorry, just, up just, the sorry, discussion. just, just oh. the same, sorry, there's a queue. So Trent Holm's next. You're, uh, you're next in the queue. I'm actually going to just time I'll save it for you. Save it? Okay, position. go ahead. Yes, uh, Joanne Harvick from the University of Wisconsin, and I teach AI, and I was lecturing yesterday, so mathematicians are brought in, and, uh, and, and computer scientists are brought into this wonderful institution. And I'm just wondering about uh, the, the difference between machine learning and uh, big data and the kinds of statistics that can at least be 
comprehended to some extent by, uh, by the mathematicians and, and uh, computer scientists and other individuals. We're entering an era in which uh, computers are making these decisions. Just think of the autonomous vehicles. Just think of the, the kinds of uh, medical uh, calculations that are being made every time one uh, plugs into a Fitbit and uh, connects to a uh, big, uh, um, uh, big uh, pharma and big uh, med med medical companies. And I'm just wondering about trust, uh, uh, focusing on that machine learning uh, level where, uh, again, machines that have been proven to come up with some pretty good uh, decisions. Uh, maybe not perfect decisions, but pretty good decisions uh, will be uh, 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 put into, uh, uh, will be in charge of processing these data and not people using Bayesian uh, statistics and all of that. Anybody want to come back? We were talking about the depth of the, the statistician, and I thought that's where you were going in your discussion because the, the normal stati uh, yeah. statisticians out the window. You, 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 set up your, your AI machine, you look for patterns, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, you, you will know uh, tons, tons more about AI than, than me. Um, but, um, I mean, I, I, what I would say is, and this comes back partly to the question I was about, is this about the decline of trust in politicians? But, I mean, of course, so much of the trust, I mean, to go back to the, the gentleman's point, is that so much of the trust in, in statistics or numbers in general concerns their official, their official quality. Um, so the question, I suppose, then is sort of to what extent you know, w w will these AI-generated uh, uh, numbers uh, ever attain that kind of public legitimacy or official status? And I think that that, that seems to me in doubt. But if they are dry, using, being used to drive your cars, yeah. and you're, they're used in every other aspect of right. your life, uh, to find out whether or not breast lumps are, mm. are uh, benign or, or, or uh, malicious in some way, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, again, as we become more... Uh, sensitized to what these machines can do, will we turn over a lot of these roles that statisticians mm. and their black magic and all of that? Mm. There, are, you know, there are so many departments that pretend, all oh, the social sciences departments that almost pretend they're physics departments mm. with, yeah. with how they massage data that really doesn't deserve to be massaged that much because it's uh, pulling data uh, at, at a pretty uh, uh, simplistic level. And so, uh, again, mm. I, I'm just wondering if, if by the death of the, the statistician. You're talking about a new kind of, uh, let's say, human-computer hybrid that will mm. be doing a number of the kinds of uh, calculations uh, that... I think, I mean, y y yes, I mean, yes, yeah. is, is the short answer, but I don't know what, I mean, I'm not going to make some kind of prediction about technologies that I don't, I, I'm not a particularly... Well, your, your grocery stores are already making decisions yeah. as to what items to stock on the basis Right, of the sure, market. sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, get, yeah. Can I just get another couple of stuff up? Um, yeah, so I, uh, I had a question about the distinction that you draw and kind of like use heavily in your, in your talk, which is the distinction between uh, to, tools of representation and tools of sensation. Mm. Uh, and so I'm sure that that uh, distinction can be made very helpfully in the, case, in the context of quantification and measurement. Mm. But I would like you to clarify that. And the reason is that uh, the, the idea that sometimes uh, tools of quantification and tools of measurement are used for representational aims and sometimes they're used for mm. uh, these as tools of sensation mm. is actually, um, it can be very misleading, again, from the mathematical point of view, uh, mm. thinking about measurement from the mathematical point of view. So measurement is defined in representational terms. Yeah. Scales are defined yeah. in representational terms, and that's why measurement... Oh, Aim of measurement is always, in some sense, representation. Yes, right. More or less, uh, whether or not it is good uh, representation, yeah. that's a different question. And so it's re I, I think it's just rhetorically at least, it's very important to kind of be clear what, it, what is meant by uh, this, this distinction that sometimes they use representation and sometimes it's not. Right. Um, I mean, I suppose the... Um, uh, well, I mean, I can explain, I can talk in philosophical terms about, I mean, these are sort of different epistemologies. Uh, I mean, so you, you, you bring up the, con the distinction between quantification and measurement as well, which is related to this. Um, and, uh, of course, measurements don't have to be quantitative measurements. So you can, you can have a sort of a tool of comparison. Um, but that tool of comparison, in order for it to be deemed legitimate, has to be publicly recognized in some way. I, if I want everybody here to use my arm as a way of kind of deciding, you know, um, height or something like that, I have to have some kind of public authority in order for that to become a, a measurement tool. Otherwise, it's just like a private thing that I'm doing on my own. Um, so that it introduces questions of, 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 of politics and of public authority. Um, and therefore, the question of 
of epistemological representation, the question of political representation start to become entangled in, in certain respects. And this is basically what this uh, crisis of expertise, which uh, if, if that's what it is, is about. It's basically that I no longer, you know, I no longer recognize that economists have the right to speak, uh, to, to tell me what the economy is, basically, because it doesn't seem to touch on my life in any meaningful way. Um, meanwhile, um, if, you know, there is a sort of... Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure I can... I'm not quite sure entirely what the question is, but, I mean, with, there's a sort of... Um, um, yeah. No, that's, that's I'm going to get just one more in before lunch, I'm afraid. Sorry to those who haven't got, but there's just one thing in the back. Firstly, yeah, just a response to previous questions I've heard um, by work for the Royal Statistical Society, and I just feel that... Um, such a range of disciplines are represented there, and it's sort of it's open to anyone who wants to join. So it's just on a matter of, of interest. Um, and a huge range of disciplines are represented, from very mathematical statistics to social statistics, um, official statistics. Um, I also had a question uh, for Glenn, really, which is: um, as methods, there's been drive for transparency in statistics and data. Um, there's been a drive for more fact-checking of politicians' claims. And there's also more digital media to, to see uh, the results of that and to see people being challenged on what they say publicly with statistics. Um, does that add up to less egregious statistical abuses if you compare it to, say, the 1970s when media was a lot slower and when maybe there wasn't this drive to publish your data and to make your metadata transparent? Well, I guess the first answer to that is that it's hard to quantify, isn't it? Because we're looking in quite a qualitative way about statistical claims. But the, the rise of watching a debate and seeing a Twitter feed or, or just, just being on the full fact Twitter feed and so you're seeing them fact check or watching a presidential debate and watching a fact check is a huge change. You didn't have that in the 1970s and 1980s. However didn't seem to make a vast impact in the US presidential election where there's it's something like a, a, a Trumpian lie every every 90, 100 seconds mm. in terms of the, uh, the fact checker's view of the truth, shall we put it that way. Um, and I think it's very, very segmented. Because if you look at the type of audience that's looking at that, in that election you're looking at a vastly skewed blue democratic audience. So, and what this leads me to think about is the culture of what we're looking at. If you look at a British general election in the 1970s, you've got a morning press conference with the journalists in quite a small room, and then you've got three or four visits a day. In these general election campaigns of 2015 to 17, you've got much less leader activity and much less uh, party activity at the centre, and probably no press, press conferences in the mornings at all, maybe one or two. So actually, in some ways, the fact-checking culture allows this politician to be quite a lot more slippery because you're not in a small room with you know, Vincent Hanna in the 1980s or, or um, you know, Robin Day, and you are therefore allowed to get out of the vice of a particular quite technocratic grey culture more quickly. But the parties claimed in 2015-17, we're not seeing a single party out in the British general elections, are fairly outlandish. So there's the famous Osborne Newsnight interview where he refuses with Evan Davis to say where the £8 billion from welfare cuts is going to come from. He point blank refuses to say, which I just don't think would have happened in the 79 election or 83 election, for instance. So I guess that's a sad story. Of, I don't think it does make politicians more accountable in terms of their facts. Mm. Okay, um, so thanks to everyone. Sorry, I know there's a few who wanted to ask a question. Um, I think that discussion really <coughs> exemplifies, in a way, the worries about Condorcet's idea that there would just be a single public discourse of statistics, because it's very difficult for uh, people, people to take part and understand everything at stake all at once. Um, so we're going to go for lunch outside now, and we come back at 2 o'clock for the second panel. So thank you very much for your speakers.